Welcome to the Climate Hour. I'm your host, Bob Grove. Today, we're going to talk about the labor movement and climate change. For a long time now, we've been saying that greenhouse gases are increasing the average surface temperature of our planet, that this global warming is disrupting normal climate patterns, and that this climate change is creating extreme weather events. I don't think we need to argue this point anymore. Record-breaking heat waves, droughts, firestorms are all around us. They're making the point for us. When we met this time last year, we talked about retraining fossil fuel workers for jobs in renewable energy, and we talked about auto workers building electric vehicles. But since then, we've experienced this unprecedented run of weather disasters, and we've seen a massive realignment of global alliances and supply chains caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. How is this impacting the labor movement? How is this affecting the movement's ability to focus on climate issues? We're joined via Zoom today by Larry Williams, Jr., Executive Director of the Labor Network for Sustainability, founder of Union Base, and former labor coordinator for the Sierra Club. Hi, Larry. Hello, happy to join you. Mijin Cha is Assistant Professor of Urban and Environmental Policy at Occidental College and a fellow at the Cornell Worker Institute. Hi, Mijin. Hi, Bob, thanks for having me. And Todd Vishan, Director of the Labor Education Action Research Network at Rutgers University. Hi, Todd. Hi, Bob. Great to be with you. So tell us a little bit more about, more about your background, both your work with labor and what brought you to the climate movement. And let's start with Larry. Yeah, so uh, I kind of landed in the climate labor movement by accident, actually. Um, I had started my college career working for the Teamsters Union, doing organizing work, and um, you know, fell in love with the labor movement and the power that you can build, or that working people can build for themselves um, in a way they can change their lives and their communities. Um, but a mentor told me about an opportunity at the Sierra Club, which is the largest environmental organization in the United States. Um, and my first week, I just kind of got hammered with all this information about climate disruption and the threat that the planet is under. Um, and at that time, there wasn't a huge analysis in the climate movement yet. It was kind of emerging at the time um, around the idea of just transition and you know workers wanting to protect themselves, uh, both in terms of you know the economics of loss from climate change, but also the physical danger of heat and other dangers from climate change. So, you know, operating at the nexus of climate and labor kind of became a specialty of mine um, and just something that I'm very passionate about. Um, and mo more recently, I became, um, actually today, <laughs> I became executive director of the Labor Network for Sustainability, which is a coalition of uh, unions at the local state and uh, level, um, state feds, joint councils, basically uh, locals that you know want to build a climate movement from their local from the bottom up um, to really change the world um, you know for working people by working people. Well congratulations on the new job position. Thank you. ask you how that's going but you know first day I'm, I'm sure you're busy and, and thank you for taking time out of your first day to be with us. So far so good. So what what's your big plans? I mean this must be exciting you have you have any uh, direction shifts or anything new you want to bring to the labor network for sustainability? Uh, it's very exciting. Um, I could say that, you know, there's already a lot of really great work being done by the staff and board. And I hope to, number one, scale that work up. There's no better time than now um, to take this movement to the next level. It's so obvious the challenges with heat that workers are dealing with, uh, floods, all kinds of really clear, obvious natural disasters. And I think uh, now, when you have a conversation with workers about climate change, and they immediately get it. Um, but the vision is for when you say just transition, I want them to immediately get it. And I want um, every local, every international union to have a climate plan uh, to know who their allies are and start building power um, to really, you know, when we have situations like we have in Congress now, uh, to let them know that if they don't come through, then there are consequences uh, and that workers are listening. Thanks, Larry. Regent, tell us a little bit about your background, what brought you to climate? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I feel like uh, maybe we talked about this last year that everybody has this great origin story and I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> but 
I uh, have been working on environmental justice issues for a long time, including during as part of my doctoral research. Um, and then I, when I started working on state and local and city uh, policy, it became clear that there was a lot of money that was going to be spent on kind of transitioning us to a greener, low carbon economy. And if we weren't careful, we were just going to replicate the patterns of the extractive economy and have a lot of low paying, low wage jobs that really extracted and exploited workers, um, which I think doesn't get us any closer to meeting our climate goals, right? Like we are in the we're, we are in a climate crisis because of our extractive systems until we end extraction in all of its forms, including extraction of people and wealth and labor, uh, we're never going to be able to address the climate crisis. Um, so since that time, I've worked uh, I work at the as a fellow at the Worker Institute at Cornell. Uh, we are the research arm of the National Climate Jobs Resource Center, uh, which works directly with unions um, at the state level to have a pro-worker, pro-climate agenda. Um, there have been some pretty big wins uh, from climate jobs work in New York and Illinois, and there are tables um, in Maine, Connecticut, Texas, Rhode Island. Um, and so it's really a way for workers to kind of have a proactive vision on what climate policies uh, they want to enact. And also that would be good for the climate and good for the workers. Um, so I would say that, you know, to me, there, the idea of inequality and the climate crisis are inextricably intertwined. And until we start to address inequality, we cannot address the climate crisis. So that means that work and workers and environmental justice communities and vulnerable communities, you know, they're really at the core of what action needs to be done and what um, they have the knowledge that we need to kind of move us to where we need to go. And then Todd and I are in, um, work on the Just Transition Listening Project, uh, which is an initiative that was started by the Labor Network for Sustainability um, that did uh, 100 interviews of people who either face transition or have faced transition in the past to really think about how do we actualize a just transition and what, are, what do we need to do to ensure that we transition workers and communities in a way that is just. Could you tell us a little bit more about your, your work as environmental policy and the Worker Institute? I mean, you actually trying to create policy for government entities? We do, yeah. So thinking about what the legislative agenda is that is pro-worker, pro-climate. So things like uh, ensuring that renewable energy build out has labor standards, right? So that we're not just building renewable energy, but we're building it in a way that is good for workers. Um, you know, thinking about, you know, what are the, if we think about the uh, inflation rate, IRA, Inflationary Reduction Act, <laughs> uh, you know, what are ways that it could have been better, right? So we can think about, you know, direct investment in environmental justice communities rather than a bunch of tax credits to private employers, you know, really thinking about how can we create policy that actually addresses the needs that people have while also addressing our climate crisis. And are we moving in that direction? Do you find that the recommendations you have are being implemented or are you I mean, is that more of a challenge than it should be? I think there is some movement at the state level. You know, we have had some big wins in Illinois, for instance. Um, at the local level, you know, I, I'm on the Los Angeles County Just Transition Task Force, and I think they're really thinking in a really thoughtful way on how do we transition our fossil fuel workforce. You know, um, people tend to think of California as a big environmentalist state, which in some ways it is, but we are also a large extraction state. So understanding how to really move away from fossil fuels is something that is very important for the state of California. I think what we see with the passage of the IRA, which is unfortunately kind of business as usual, is that the equity provisions, the things that really help vulnerable communities are the first to go. Um, and so that I think we still have a ton of work to do. Um, we need to build more power. We need to build more um, of a base so that we can you know, put more pressure on elected officials. But it is very disheartening to see uh, that the first things to be stripped are the things that help working people and vulnerable people the most. Absolutely. Todd, just jump over to you. Give us a little bit about your background, your current work at Rutgers. Sure. So uh, like Larry, I kind of came into this through through the labor side first or the union side first. And, um, you know, it's all started when I was born in Eastern Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> really, it was a childhood experience of uh, growing up in a relatively low income household prior to my father becoming a union member. And when he got involved with the Carpenters Union, we just saw this massive improvement of our quality of our life, right? Our family went into the middle class. I got glasses, I got braces. And it was a very tangible experience of life before and after having a union job. So that experience kind of shaped my understanding of the power of labor and unions at a pretty early age. 
So I took, you know, unionized jobs in the summers in high school and in college. I worked as a laborer in the laborers union. Um, I was a member of the steel workers and worked in a paper mill. So I had a variety of good paying union jobs, you know, in the early 1990s, paying more than $15 an hour, which, you know, workers today without a union are still fighting to get $15 an hour 30 years later. Um, so that was a really, you know, shaped my understanding of the power of having a union. So you fast forward, I, I ended up joining the Carpenters Union myself after I got out of college. I was kind of floundering around a bit and, and I became a union carpenter for about 10 years in eastern Connecticut, worked in the largely in the energy sector at our local nuclear power plant. Um, but the Great Recession hit in 2008 and everybody was laid off and we were unemployed for a year and a half, two years without work. Um, and my wonderful wife had the great idea of saying, you always said you want to go back to college. Now is the time. So I did. I ended up in grad school. And this was the first time I was in a non-union job when I was a research assistant and a teaching assistant at the University of Connecticut. So uh, a few of us got together and you know, decided we want to do something about it. And we collected cards and organized a local of the United Auto Workers with 2,200 new members, got the union recognized in 2014, won our first contract in 2015. And lo and behold, I got elected as the first president of the union. And the first thing that I want to do, much like Larry said, you have this, here's an organization, what do you want to do? We said, let's poll the members and see what are the issues they care about. We just won health care, we just won wages. And guess what one of the top issues was? Climate change and climate justice. You know, a lot of our members were scientists and they felt like they weren't being heard. You know, government policy was not reflective of all of their recommendations for decades and decades about the changes that were going to be coming as a result of climate change that we're now experiencing as predicted. Um, but policymakers were really just, you know, looking more to the interests of, of the fossil fuel industry than rather than following the science. So at that point, I got involved with the Connecticut Roundtable on Climate and Jobs, which is now one of the groups that Mijin mentioned that's involved with the National Climate Resource Center. And uh, through there, I met, you know, the Labor Network for Sustainability and just kind of married my interests in, in representing workers' rights and justice, as well as promoting a safe, livable climate for, you know, not only for ourselves, but for our children, which is really kind of the personal aspect for it for me. I have three kids and it's just, just no greater injustice than to pass on the burden of an unlivable planet to a generation in the future that has had nothing to do with it and no say in it whatsoever, but is only going to inherit all the consequences and problems. Absolutely. I've heard all of you touch on this. I mean, Larry mentioned um, just transition, Mijin talking about an equity, uh, you just mentioned climate, um, climate justice, all those things. So let's talk about that for a moment. Let's talk about environmental justice and climate equity. How is the labor movement addressing these important issues? You want to start, Larry? Sure. Um, I actually think that you know, and you know, in all fairness, this is not speaking for the entire labor movement. Um, I think that there are some parts of the labor movement that are more engaged in that conversation than others. Um, some that you know are taking themselves very seriously as part of a community um, outside of their membership, and then there are parts of the labor movement that have a long way to go. Um, so I'd rather not generalize and say the labor movement as a whole, um, but I've seen some really great work in New York, for example. Um, and I think, you know, communities uh, have different sets of problems. I saw an article today talking about how the African-American community um, is impacted by climate change in a much different way because of the way heat may hit communities that are, you know, the concrete jungles of New York. Um, and then depending on, you know, what type of laborers you have in your community, um, you know, if your community is mostly workers who work outside, the unbearable heat, it's a lot more difficult to bear that, right? Um, now, if you're a worker who is not in a union, you have no recourse to that. There's nothing you can do to try to change the environment within which you work. But if you work in a heavily unionized industry, let's say you work and you're represented by Unite Here, you work in Las Vegas, terrible heat, but you have a union, you have a process through which to manage that. Um, but I think, you know, if a union doesn't have membership that is being affected by climate directly right now, they may not have it as a top issue. But if it's not a top issue now, it will be soon. So that's why you see kind of a disparity in the reaction. Are your members being impacted now, right? Are they coming to you with those complaints now? If they're not coming to you with those complaints now, what do you foresee in the next five to 10 years? I think that that's how we're thinking about it, right? Trying to get folks to have the conversation now before it hits them directly. 
I've been in conversations um, with union leaders going back as far as five years in places like uh, New Orleans, where there's they're dealing with issues around land loss. They already have the extraction industries, and it's a complicated web issue because people. Um, this is how communities survive a lot of times off of these wages and off of um, an industry that has the best paying wages in the area. But on the other hand, you've got this incredible kind of toxic sludge that's being created and a, a terrible environment that's being created at the same time. So I think it's, you know, projects like the Just Transition Listening Project really bring that to bear when you realize there's no one voice, there's no one issue here. This is actually a, a big web. And if we're going to solve this, we're going to have to do it together. Agent equity, climate equity, environmental justice. Yeah, I mean, I think there is right that, you know, labor is not a monolith, but I think there are examples that we can point to that I think are encouraging. Uh, you know, the Rhode Island Climate Jobs Coalition it deliberately included environmental justice organizations in their formation so that environmental justice was something that would be co-created as what would be there from the beginning. Um, too often, I think, uh, policies and proposals are created, and then there's an equity component stuck on at the end, right? That's not actually equity. Equity is the co-development of ideas and policies so that, you know, from the beginning, it is an equitable issue. Um, so what that looks like is, you know, there's a, I, I, one of my favorite examples is the Carbon Free and Healthy Schools Initiative, which is that um, looking at schools because they are hubs of communities um, and also where most vulnerable populations are children, right? So ensuring that they are up to date in terms of, you know, HVAC and also, you know, making them as carbon neutral as possible, installing solar, um, and then ensuring that the school buses are electric so that, you know, you reduce a lot of that localized pollution. Um, and then thinking of it as a community hub. So, you know, not just that we have a, a school that is, you know, energy efficient and has goods uh, and has soul and all that, but perhaps it could be a cooling center for communities as, you know, as temperatures increase. So really thinking about, I think, for me, I think the way that to think about it is like, how do we integrate work into communities and not think of it as a labor issue is separate. And then the equity issue is separate, right? They're together. Uh, workers live in communities, right? They're, they're not separate. It's that we are all part of this broader community. And so what is best for the community is best for all of us. And I think that's really what I think about when I think about, you know, ways that equity can be integrated into different issues is that really thinking from the beginning, right? Including these voices and these ideas from the beginning and not as an add-in and then seeing it as a shared struggle, right? Like it's not that we do equity because it's good for a community that's far from us, right? Like the equity concerns of the IRA are that it, incre that it continues and increases fossil fuel expansion and use. That's bad for all of us. There's a disproportionate impact, of course, for vulnerable communities, but that will hurt all of us. So not thinking of it as something that's separate from us, that these are things that, you know, and issues that are concerning a separate entity or separate population, but that we're all in this together. So when you're doing your work with the Workers Institute, you're creating brainstorming on these policies. Are you just including equity as, as part of your policy or do you have people that are thinking, how do we achieve that? Um, you know, I don't know if it's as prescriptive as that. What we usually do is we bring unions together here, think about what their concerns are, what their challenges are, what they would like to see. And then we think about policies that can achieve those ends. Um, and so I would say the work that we have done with the unions that we have worked with, they are obviously concerned about racial justice, economic justice. And so I think, you know, when we talk about equity, that's really what we're talking about, right? We're really talking about justice. Um, and I think, you know, the labor movement historically has been a big part of social justice movements. So that I think is a continuation of this idea that, you know, it's not just about work and workers, but again, a broader social justice movement. So um, that also means increasing membership of unions to kind of get past some of this historical racism that has existed, right? So it's, I see it at many different levels, but really thinking about, you know, equity, I think has become kind of neoliberalized, but really at the, con at the crux of it is, you know, how do we build a more just future? Um, and so that is kind of what is pervades kind of our thinking on like what policies would be most appropriate. That's great. And, you know, whenever I think of justice, as you said, labor movement has always been at the lead of that. I kind of see those inextricably combined. At the same time, I don't think a lot of people understand that there is um, a climate equity issue. You know, they think we fix climate that addresses everybody. But as Larry was saying, I mean, different 
different groups have different climate needs. And so often the climate solutions that are being offered are addressing wealthier engendered um, solutions instead of helping the people that need it most. I've often said that the people that are most responsible for climate change, or no, I'm saying that backwards, the, the people that are least responsible for climate change are the ones that most that are most affected by it. So I think this is important. Absolutely. Issue. And I didn't mean to, to suggest that equity is not an issue. Of course not. But I think it has become so neoliberalized that it doesn't address to your exact point that the people that have contributed to the climate crisis the least also have the least resources to deal with the impacts of the climate crisis. So understanding and supporting those communities, of course, is what we need to be doing. But I think too often equity means like, oh, we do what we want to do, and then we do something for communities of color, right? That to me, that is not equity. All right, I, don't, I couldn't agree more. Todd, climate justice. Yeah, and just kind of echoing and building off of what Mijin and, and Larry said, it's, you know, labor is not a monolith, right? Unions ultimately at the end of the day are democratic organizations and they're organized at the local level, right? There are national unions, but a national union is really an umbrella of a number, you know, 10, 20, 100,000 local unions that elect their own local leaders. And it's it's the voices that kind of channel up through the unions from the bottom at the local level and on upward that kind of shape different priorities for different unions. And, uh, you know, as Larry mentions that, you know, there are workforces that are unionized that are being really impacted by climate justice issues, right? There are, um, you know, the vulnerable communities that Mijin mentioned, those would be workers in what kind of occupations or occupational segregation in the United States has, due to the historical, you know, racism in hiring and also the racism within some unions, to be perfectly honest that you see an overrepresentation of you know workers of color from these communities that are being impacted by climate change also situated in lower income employment situations as well right it's not a coincidence um, but we have unions like the service employees union um, that's organizing workers in the service industry and you have very diverse unions with the members coming out of the communities that are the environmental justice communities and then those demands are funneling up through the union as a worker justice issue um, and you maybe don't see that as much in, say, a like my former union, the Carpenters Union, where you have an, an overrepresentation of white male workers who are making a pretty good income with a pension and retirement. Um, and perhaps climate change for them, the threat is more that it's going to undermine future employment opportunities until they start experiencing the events that we're talking about now. So the people they're getting hit first are getting hit first worse. And then they're able to channel that up through their unions if they have a union, which is why I think organizing more unions is a really important solution for not only for climate justice, but for you know economic justice in general. And Todd, you mentioned that the Carpenters Union is maybe more older white males, um, brings up the issue that the young people are the ones going to be most impacted by the climate. I mean, we're leaving the planet to them and all the problems that we're, we're addressing and wondering about today, they're going to live with. Um, I'm, I'm curious, are, are there certain unions that are more representative of this younger generation? Um, you know, certain unions that are going to be more focused on how young people are going to um, have to face these things in the future? Um, you know, I would say some of the unions that have a lot of younger workers would be like the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, which represents lots of, you know, grocery store employees. So they have a real large number of younger workers. We see a lot of workers organizing um, at Starbucks locations right now. And uh, there's definitely lots of dots being connected there among those workers between not only their wages and working conditions, but also the general exploitation of nature, the planet and, and fellow human beings. So uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there is a little bit of concentration of younger workers, but I think in the building trades and construction trades, there's gonna be a point where there needs to be a lot of new workers brought into these industries because it's an aging, worker population. It really is. And um, recruitment has been somewhat difficult. Um, I don't want to get too deeply into it, but you know, I've talked to many organizers and business managers and construction unions saying a lot of young people just don't want to go into blue collar work. They're being, you know, told from a young age that they need to go to college and pursue, you know, kind of a white collar college educated career. Um, but maybe people are realizing now that that leads you to a lot of debt and not necessarily a good job, whereas a building trades apprenticeship leads you to a good job with zero debt, uh, yet to be determined. Only time will tell. 
That's, that's a good point. And I wonder, uh, we talk about extraction jobs versus renewable energy jobs. Wouldn't the renewable energy jobs be more appealing to that demographic we're talking about? Um, uh, in terms of ideological preference, sure. But uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the, it depends what renewable energy jobs we're talking about, right? A lot of the jobs are really not unionized and not paying well. Like the most common uh, renewable energy job is a rooftop solar installer. And that's a pretty not high paying job. Um, very low levels of unionization in that sector. But of course, oh, as I said, we need to have more organizing to make all of these jobs into better jobs. That, that's your point, that installation job should be unionized and then it would be well paid. Larry, you can comment? Yeah, that's exactly where I was gonna go with it. Um, you know, we have this saying, uh, you wanna create a career, not just a job. So a lot of these workers tend to install the solar on the roof and then what happens after that, right? They should be trained to do other things besides just doing that installation, maybe the entire the interior of the house and do other things there. And if it's a union job, and if specifically if they start with like a pre-apprenticeship, they do everything in the house, electricity, uh, you know, they can even get a little bit of plumbing, but it should be a thinking about how this person as a whole person can be trained to do things, um, especially when it comes to like retrofitting, things that can actually decrease energy use, all this stuff is futuristic. But the fact that the, like Todd said, the industry has such low unionization means that you can't even have these conversations with the workers at mass because we just don't know. We don't know what they want, what they need, what they're thinking. Um, and I think while this wave is happening, Amazon labor union and Starbucks and a lot of the other union movements that are happening rather quietly, I think that now it's even bigger than we actually realize because <clears throat> the media only covers these things when there's a victory, but there's a lot of losses happening at the same time in these organizing campaigns. And the loss doesn't mean that's the end of it. It just means that people are learning and they're getting better at organizing. So I think one of the indicators we can look at is how many elections are being held, how many attempts are being made, and then that should translate. You know, we know in 2017 was the first year that I think it was like three out of five people joined the union was under the age of 35. So this has been happening for a while. Um, and so we should be looking for this wave to continue in the next three to five years, but we really need to water that plant as it grows. You're listening to the Climate Hour. I'm your host, Bob Grove. We're speaking with Todd Vashan, Todd Vashan, Mijin Cha, and Larry Williams about the labor movement and climate change. Now, the big news kind of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Obviously, that's um, disrupting so many things. It's disrupting the fossil fuel supplies to Europe and other regions. It's forcing nations around the world to reconsider their transitions to renewable energy. For example, Germany is reopening their coal power plants and reconsidering its phase out of nuclear power. Even California is rethinking the shutdown of its last nuclear power plant, Diablo. And now there's this new surge in drilling and fracking to replace the Russian fossil fuels that are no longer making it to the West. One could argue that this war is the perfect opportunity to rapidly move to renewable energy, create all those new jobs, you know, sustainability. But others are arguing that the war makes it impossible to transition away from fossil fuels. So how does this war affect the retraining of labor forces, the adoption of renewable energy, electric vehicles, and other sustainability solutions? Mijin, do you wanna jump, jump in on that? Sure, I mean, I think, the response that we're saying is is the wrong response. So, for instance, reopening Diablo is a terrible idea, not just because of the you know nuclear issues with nuclear issue, nuclear energy, but there are so many retrofits that have to be done to the plant to make it any kind of safety compliant, which is why it was shut down in the first place, right? So, we are just delaying uh, the, an inev inevitable transition, right? As long as we are have a fossil fuel based economy, we will always be in this problem. Um, shifting to renewables, you know, nobody owns the sun or the winds. Uh, and I think that's part of the reason why private companies are so against it, right? That they can only have so much control. But the the, so the solution to this um, Russian crisis is not to increase oil and gas drilling, right? And not to further lock in fossil fuels. So this idea that we would start to build more liquid LNG terminals is ridiculous because first of all, it takes 10 years to build an LNG terminal. So it doesn't help our immediate needs, right? Um, so to me, the idea that we would double down on fossil fuels is just ensuring that this crisis comes about again. 
Um, and the way, way for us to really become independent is to have energy democracy, which is really to have localized control over renewable energy and have localized energy sources. That's the real solution to this, to this issue. In terms of the Policy Institute and your work there, are, how, how is the Ukrainian war affecting your policy decisions, policy recommendations? I mean, to me, I think that the, the fact that Russia controls so much of the natural gas supply is just even more reason for us to transition away from fossil fuels, right? Like one entity having that much control over an energy source is destabilizing as we are seeing. Um, so I guess to me, the solution is to accelerate the energy transition away from fossil fuels, not to double down on fossil fuel infrastructure. I couldn't agree more. Larry, what's your thoughts on the whole Russian-Ukrainian war thing? How's it affecting labor? How's it affecting renewables? Well, I can say that, you know, the most direct link that I see is the economic impact, right? When you have a war like this that, you know, scares the markets, unfortunately, we're at the mercy of the markets. And we see that corporations, whenever they have a loss, they pass it on to workers. The difference now is that the balance of power has shifted, both because of the way COVID, COVID has impacted the uh, economy, where there's a lot more power in the hands of working people. Um, you know, there's, we saw recently that the job numbers have been a bit better, but a lot of folks have been very hesitant about going back to work and working in the office. Um, we've been seeing people reluctant to take jobs that pay less and have less benefits. So, you know, obviously the focus should be on the safety of the Ukrainian people and figuring out you know, what's going to happen with Russia. Um, but I usually take it back to the more human element, which is how is this impacting uh, the average person and how they put bread on the table, put food on the table. And the fact is that, you know, when the markets go up and down, investors lose you know money here money there but the average working person that is not a part of the one percent or you know the people that are going to benefit from this crisis are just thinking about how to make it so you know unionization is still something that's always on my mind because that's one of the biggest protections against homelessness and all the other economic damages that come about uh and i kind of leave the 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 war and political talk to other folks but i will say that you know when i talk to working people a lot of their minds are work, their minds are on how am I going to survive this difficult economic time? You know, and they seem to come every what ten years or so, twenty eight, two thousand eight. You know, it, you know they come over and over. Um, and right now, I, I think that um, the average person is either trying to figure out how to get in a union, or you know, trying to figure out how they can get their friends and family in the union so they can be protected. Odd. What's your thoughts on the Ukrainian war? Yeah, you know, really the, the calls <laughs> to go backwards, really, to go back to more coal and to go back to drilling more oil are really reflective of a few things. I think it's one, a lack of creative thinking, obviously. Two, a lack of ambition. Three, just a symbol of the complete entrenchment of power of the fossil fuel industry in our country, not just our country, but in the world economy. Um, and four, just kind of the power of this free market ideology that underpins most policy discussions that really we can't even talk about ideas of using the government or the public sector to solve our collective problems when the reality is that's what the government and public sector are there to do. Um, you know, a lot of folks in the labor climate movement before, even before the Green New Deal resolution was introduced, would talk about a World War II style buildup. Like the way to address the climate crisis is to have massive public investment, create jobs, people putting to putting people to work, building the renewable energy infrastructure we need and the timeline that we need to do it in. Um, and we're just not hearing conversations about that. It's all about market solutions, which we've been trying market solutions for 40 years and have not been delivering on, on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And the first thing that happens when uh, you know the fossil fuel supply gets disrupted, we want to pivot back to drilling more oil here at home. And it's just that's just backwards thinking as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I think that we should be thinking bigger, more ambitiously. Uh, the United States has a history of doing this, as we did with World War II. We went from having a very limited military to having the most powerful military in the world in a matter of, what, five or six years. And uh, I think the same can be done with uh, climate change and renewable energy. And I think that obviously the, the need is there for it. We see the crisis expanding and drilling more oil is just going to make the problem worse. Agree with you more, but how, how do we convince the public of that, the policymakers and such? I mean, what what actions do we as labor take to move in that direction? 
Well, I think like anything that's on labor's agenda, there's it's a three-step process. It's educate, organize, and agitate. Um, part of it is educating our own members and ourselves about the ills of climate change and the ability to use our public resources to address it. Um, the other part is organizing, uh, you know, across unions and with other social movements and environmental justice groups to build a powerful, broad coalition to support these policies. And then once we have that coalition, we agitate. We, you know, as Larry said, if people aren't delivering the goods, we vote them out and replace them. We show up at their offices and protests. There's, you know, a long history of social movements being very effective um, in delivering the goods when people are organized in mass and can speak truth to power. So I think the answer, as is with most things for me, is organizing. Organizing the education. And I, I think the show here, I mean, just talking about this is some education, getting that out to people and letting them understand that we don't have to double down on fossil fuels, that this is a great time to move forward on renewable solutions. Um, Todd, I, I love your, your example of how America can really surge forward, you know, take this as an opportunity to move into new technologies to become great at something that we haven't before. So it is a challenge. Another thing that's happening um, with this Russian war is Russia's push to occupy the Donbass regions, you know, the industrial regions of Ukraine. And that, that's a massive area and Russia's taking over a lot of that. So we're not only seeing the wartime destruction of manufacturing capabilities, but perhaps the long-term occupation of, of areas that were very responsible for manufacturing around the world, you know, providing products for exports and such. How's this going to impact labor? What are your thoughts on that? Um, how do we replace this loss of manufacturing? What does that mean to labor here in the United States? Larry, you have any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, the history of manufacturing in the U.S. is one where we saw massive um, outsourcing uh, globally, and we saw that corporations seeing a way to gain profits by finding workers here, putting them elsewhere, and also escape the power of unionization. And I think that, um, you know, the question is, do we think that corporations are going to suddenly say, let's move our operations back to the U.S.? Um, because of the difficulty there. I mean, the likelihood, in my opinion, is that they just go to more low-cost countries and keep popping around. Um, in the past, they've gone to China, India, and, you know, picking countries that have low unionization and, and low wages. Um, I don't know that we have much power as labor to control, you know, the means of production, but I do think that we should be supporting workers around the world who are trying to defend themselves from the system to try to protect themselves, and then also educating ourselves on um, what are the links in the supply chain? You know, what powers do we have to help workers in those places and stop kind of otherizing them? We're doing a youth worker convergence with the Labor Network for Sustainability in September, and I'm sure that's going to be one of the conversations. It's like, where are the chains? Uh, you know, even young people who work in an Amazon facility are connected to workers on the other side of the world that are making those cheap devices. And so I think showing those connections, educating people on those, and then using the power that we have. We have these new incredible powers of social media, and I don't think we should just use it to make TikTok videos and latest dances. I think we should be using it to build power and support people who really want to change things. I agree. Uh, you mentioned China there. I mean, I'm picking on Russia today, but you know, China's part of this too. We're, we're seeing a realignment of global powers back into Cold War, where we've got West and East, and even China and Russia kind of aligning. So where we have relied on a lot of outsourcing to China, I see that being problematic going forward. And you know, I welcome your opinion on that. But the, the, the fact that the relationship between the US and China is, is degrading rapidly, um, and for us to be dependent on China for our chips or other manufactured items is really a security risk. Doesn't that, imply and drive the need for us to research, to rebuild our manufacturing capabilities in the US region? Well, I think one thing that I think we should avoid is, is what I think is rapidly going into jingoism, right? That the, you know, the reason why China makes all of our chips is because corporations here decided it would be cheaper and their profits would expand. Um, and that, you know, this too often I think devolves into anti-Chinese sentiment, uh, which at a time of raising uh, violence against Asian Americans is not productive. 
Um, and I think that, you know, what we have to think about is the decisions that were made that have resulted in the situation that we face now. And those decisions were all in the, the advantage of capital. So, you know, it's not as if this kind of happened as Larry was mentioning, right? Like these are all deliberate decisions by companies to offshore their manufacturing capabilities because they wanted to make more money. So I think it's, you know, important, this often too often gets phrased as like big, big bad, evil China taking over the world and scapegoats the fact that this is what capital wanted uh, and is now, we are now seeing the consequences of it. It's never a good idea to consolidate any kind of industrial process in anywhere. And that is what has happened, right? So I kind of agree with Larry that the idea that we'll rebuild our manufacturing base, of course, I think it would be great. Those are good, you know, middle-class jobs. Do I think companies are willing to pay those wages? No. And I think that Larry's absolutely right that they will just go find the next cheap place, which underscores the point of we need global solidarity, right? If we had global labor standards, then capital couldn't find the next place to exploit. But as long as we don't, that's what's going to happen. So I think... Placing the blame on China is a little bit misguided, that it is really uh, capital that has created the situation that we are in now, and that it's corporations who wanted to maximize their profits. Um, so, of course, all of these things have big implications and security implications for our for us, not just in the US, but globally, right? It, it's not good to consolidate this much, consolidate this much. But I think it's important to realize what has led to this and it is a series of very deliberate decisions to maximize corporate profits. Now, I couldn't agree more. I think it's natural for corporations to want to make a profit. That's their entire purpose to exist. I mean, capitalism. So they are going to go where it's cheaper. How do we balance that, that demand for good quality, high paying jobs for our workers with this, this corporate need to find cheap labor? I mean, how, how does that resolve itself, Todd? Well, I think Meijin made a really good point about global labor standards, right? So what we have is have been having for 40 plus years is a race to the bottom. You know, the companies are just if if labor standards or, or even just to connect the dots further, environmental standards start to impinge upon the profit of company A and country A, it's going to relocate to country B where there is fewer labor standards or fewer environmental protections, right? So where they can pour the pollution in the river and pay the workers as close to zero an hour is where all of the factories are ultimately gonna end up. Um, and then it's pitting countries against each other in a race to attract companies that will create jobs. But at some point the jobs are pretty meaningless. They're not really helping to lift up the working people and they're not creating a tax base for local economies. Um, and they're really just extracting both the labor of the people and the natural resources of the planet to create massive wealth for the richest 1% of human society, who, by the way, is, is you know, responsible for more than 10% of the carbon emissions alone themselves because of their extravagant lifestyles that they live off of by exploiting their labor power and exploiting the earth. So, yeah, I think labor standards are a very big piece of it. Even if we bring, we're able to bring some manufacturing back home to the U.S., we would want it to be attached to having labor standards. Um, it, that's just the bottom line, because without having that global solidarity, the companies are pitting workers in, in countries against each other in a race to the bottom. Who do we have that's working on global solidarity, those, those larger based global labor issues? Is the United Nations involved with that? Are there other organizations that are taking a lead on that? Well, there are international union confederations, um, but you know, part of the problem is just like is is true in the U.S. A huge percentage of workers are not actually members of unions, so there's there are efforts to build solidarity across unions across borders, um, but that doesn't account for the massive number of workers in the global south who don't have a union or have very repressive governments that you know we have extreme anti-union tactics in the U.S., but you know at least at this point in history, Amazon doesn't have people out there with snipers shooting organizers where they do in other parts of the world. We did have that in the US 100 years ago. Um, and, you know, that's that's a different kind of measure. But yeah, so uh, groups like the International Labor Organization, they're always coming up with ideas and convening ways to try and build this. Um, but again, it's it's a work in progress and a lot, lot more needs to be done. Meechan, thoughts on that, uh, you know, global labor movements? Yeah, I was sorry, I was laughing because I was like, does the United Nations ever do anything? <laughs> <laughs> no, let's not be mean to the United Nations. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, serious. I mean, it just seems that I, I think the one issue is that we have these big 
multinational global conglomerates that have a ton of resources that are really maintaining the status quo, right? And the status quo is the problem. So uh, I think that, you know, there is good grassroots global organizing, but it's underfunded, as Todd mentioned, and uh, it's just, we just need a ton more resources. But we also need people to, you know, start kind of including it in their own fights, right? So global labor standards is something that like we also have to be willing to fight for, even if it's something that we think is not going to directly impact us because it does directly impact us. So I guess when I think about, you know, global labor solidarity, it is that like we start to think of capital as the enemy that it is and that the pressure is not just what about my contract, but what about what's the larger impact of it, right? Like what is the bigger systemic change that will happen? Because I just don't see any way for us to move to a more just world without some pretty big systemic changes. Larry, thoughts on this global labor movement? Yeah, the first thing that came to mind for me was uh, trade unions for energy democracy. Um, and the energy democracy issue that Mijin brought up a little earlier, uh, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, exerting power um, to support unions in Latin America, for example, um, or even in the African continent where they're in a different situation than we are here, right? In, in North America, where um, they have so many natural resources that are untapped. And it's a tremendous, tremendous draw um, when people, when companies come in and say, oh, well, we'll go ahead and mine here, we'll drill here, uh, we'll give you hundreds of billions of dollars to build a port here. Um, and it becomes this, you know, race, race to the bottom, uh, not even realizing necessarily that uh, where the states is, even though we're a very rich country, um, we're also facing the impact of hunting for those fossil fuels for years and years and years. So it's kind of difficult to describe that to people who haven't necessarily seen that impact. Uh, and they're trying to get their economy into a better position, right? So um, this is something I've talked to folks about in the African continent quite a bit, which is um, if someone, um, if a community is not transitioning from fossil fuels, what are they transitioning to? If your community is, let's say, for example, solely based on you know fishing and living off natural resources, it's kind of hard to envision where you would go from there because that's the life that you know. Um, so that's what I mean when I say just transition. It does really, I mean, it seriously looks different everywhere you go, you know. Um, but in terms of solidarity, I think if folks in the U.S. want to support other people's movements, they need to listen, you know, truly understand what the situation is and not try to apply our American-based solutions to what their community is going through. And at the same time, you might learn that you're actually impacting them in ways you didn't realize and that you have more power than you thought to help them fight the battle that they're fighting. I don't think that we should be going and trying to force our battle on other people, but we should be looking for the links between our struggle and their struggle. This time last year at the end of our show, um, I asked you what advice you had for our listeners, our labor union listeners, and it seemed like a lot of that was retraining for renewables, you know, um, moving into sustainable jobs. What's your advice this year? Has it changed? Is it the same? Todd? Um, I think it's still education. I mean, maybe not necessarily in terms of skills, but educating not only yourself, but educating those around you who maybe are not connecting the dots in the way that we have tried to do here on, on your program today. Between the, you know, the, the woes of working people and the woes of the planet are, are really, can you can point to the same cause. You know, there's a really elite group of capitalists that are just exploiting the planet and exploiting the workers. And I think the more of us that understand that and the more that our friends and neighbors and family members understand that and we stop pointing fingers at each other and falling into the traps of racism and xenophobia and every other simplistic explanation of inequality that the you know, right wing movements would throw at us and understand that it, it's really the most powerful people that are influencing uh, the outcomes and have the power to pull the levers. Uh, the better off we will all be in terms of, you know, rallying around solutions that benefit all of us, all working people. Agent, what do you want to say to our labor and union listeners? Uh, I mean, I agree with everything Todd said. And also, I think we need power. Right. I think it just I just can't see any way around it. We need to we need power. We need to think about how to build power and how to deploy power. Um, so, you know, it's I think it's not just enough to like sit on the sidelines and think about, you know, what is the best thing to do, but we really need to think about how do we build power and how do we then use that power in a way to advance our goals. It's a little bit more like thinking of ourselves, you know, I think that there's maybe 
folks that want to think of themselves as apolitical or nonpartisan and all of that. And we just don't live in that world anymore. So I just think that, you know, if I had one thing to say is that we have to think of ourselves as power actors and think about how we can build the most power that we can to advance, you know, the, the ambitious climate and worker goals that we want to. Thank you. Larry, what do you want to say to our listeners? That was very well said. And that's exactly uh, what our organization is hoping to do. Um, you know, if you are a person in the labor union and you view climate as important to you, we want you. We want you to be a part of our network. We want to start building with you. We want you to start thinking about uh, what's the best version of your community um, that you can see in your mind. And let's work to build that. And, you know, climate change is something that's not going away. It's going to be either in the background or in the foreground. And it's going to be threatening lives, uh, your local economy, uh, and the lives of your children. So um, it's an opportunity for us to try to mend all the social issues that we have and at the same time build an economy that actually is just and actually is fair. Let's look at this as an opportunity, uh, one that we can't ignore. Larry, where will you send people to learn more about your work? Uh, you can visit laborforsustainability.org. And, and that's, that's number, number four. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Agent, where would you like to send people? Uh, I have a rudimentary website. <laughs> it's <laughs> www.mijinchacha.com. Thank you. Todd, where can people go to learn more about your work? So I think the easiest thing is to just do a web search of Rutgers Learn. The acronym L-E-A-R-N is that's the Labor Education Action Research Network. And that's where you'll find uh, everything that we're working on here. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners. We welcome your questions and feedback. You can learn more about the Climate Hour at climatehour.net. That's climatehour.net. This is the Climate Hour. I'm your host, Bob Grove.